of the 80 mic and had the snare team, which is snow and ice uh, recovery. We just don't have it all for the most probably to, to, to do. But they said they were going to increase it. That was going to be their, their focus because they never know when this may come again. And then I was just saying, with all of our snow days, I mean, it wasn't very many trucks that laid down. Good morning. All right. All right, if everyone will take their seat, we're going to go on and get started. I hope everyone has, I hope everyone has enjoyed the refreshments and the chit and chatting. And, uh, <laughs> We're ready to get our program started. And first, I want to thank the planning committee, uh, chaired by John Land. Where are you, John? For uh, putting this together for us. At this time, we don't want to hold you up. We don't want to be here all day Saturday because I know you have <laughs> other things to do. I'm going to, at this time, introduce our speaker for this moment. And I want to recognize uh, Marshall Greg Countryman. So I'm going to let him come up here and speak, but I guess he said that's okay. Uh -huh. But anyway, we're glad to have you here. <coughs> All right, our speaker today, and we are so proud of her. Uh, we uh, Everybody knows Donna Tompkins, <laughs> and uh, I'm not going to try to read all of her bio. <laughs> But I just want to let you know that uh, she has probably worked in every area of the sheriff's department. She started out in recorder's court as a court clerk. And uh, she moved on into uh, working with the patrol services, the patrol administrative uh, division, patrol and administrative division. Human resources, uh, her promotions are steadily right in there. She has uh, worked her way up to the top. So we are very proud of her. Uh, Donna is not only uh, the sheriff, but as sheriff, she's become a history maker. <laughs> she is the first female that has ever held that position. And I know that her family is supportive of her. She's married and has two children. And how she has time to be sheriff and be mom <laughs> and be wife and all of that is amazing. But I'm not going to uh, go any further because you all know Donna. And I think enough has been said. And at this time, Donna, would you come up and take the mic? Yeah. Yes, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And I, too, want to thank the Democratic Party. I want to thank the uh, Planning Committee for inviting me this morning. Um, and I just want to stop at this time and, and thank the Democratic Party for their support during the last election. Um, I, I was listening to, I always sit and listen to people talk about me, and it seems strange. But I did work my way all the way up, uh, starting as a civilian. I was talking to the ladies outside who were holding a... Um, um, well, kids get scholarships to go to college and I was talking to some of those ladies over there and I said you know when I came out of high school we were poor and I went to college on Pell Grants and as we began to talk we came to a conclusion some of the things that my mother said to me um, you know they were very familiar with and, and we came to the conclusion that so many things divide us but there are a lot of things that we all want the same. That's right. We want our kids to have an opportunity. We want our kids to be able to go to college. We want we want security in our community. There's just a lot of things that, that we don't have to fight about, you know? So anyway, I, I'm appreciative of being here this morning. Um, I hear that, you know, I'm historic, and that seems a little strange to me, but I know that it's true. But when I ran for office, I thought, I, I remember reading something Condoleezza Rice wrote, and she said, 
the people that, that make history or the first to do things like that, most of the time they don't consider it that way. They just say, why could I not? Mm. And, and so that's certainly the way that I looked at it when I was running for sheriff. Why not? Mm. Why not? And so um, this first year has been <laughs> kind of like a, a story in the sense of the best of times and the worst of times. Uh, but, but to talk a little bit about where we were when I came in, um, I walked into four piles. And I sorted through those four piles of information. And what I came to learn really quickly was there wasn't a system, there wasn't a process, and there wasn't anyone that knew everything. It was all very, very scattered. So when I started looking at contracts, because that's something I ran on, I said, I'm going to look at everything we do and try to be physically responsible to, to the people of Muskogee County. So I was able to do that. We uh, immediately renegotiated one contract uh, that was going, that had been signed by the previous administration and would have cut approximately $250,000 of general revenue to the city. So I immediately did away with that contract and, and renegotiated. So save $250,000 in revenue to the city that they had always gotten. Um, one of the things that we looked at was our medical and we were spending approximately a million dollars a year in pharmaceuticals. And we are on track right now because of renegotiating that, saving 28%. That's huge on a million dollars. And that was simply by taking a hands-on approach and talking to people. Yeah, it really does amaze me how far the communication had gotten away. So those are a couple of things that we did. Um, financially, we've done things, we continue to, to work in our communities. You know, I don't know if any of you are aware, but from our jail programs, uh, uh, Pastor Neil Richardson is our chaplain, and he has established the uh, Safe House, which is a wonderful place for homeless or people to go in times like the weather we've had lately. Another thing that I said that I would do when I ran was to reestablish what I saw as very broken relationships between the city, the police department, even Marshall's office. Uh, and so I have worked to do that. Are we 100? No, but we're working on it. And, and I hope and believe that my office is supportive of those other offices. Um, so that's where we kind of, that's kind of what we came into and kind of where we've been working but I certainly see new challenges. Um, one of the biggest challenges that I'm seeing that we're, uh, every facility in this city appears to have infrastructure issues. Certainly the jail does, uh, whether it's the heat or the water or, or whatever, these are old buildings. And, and I think at some point, the city will have to address some of that. We've got to keep them up or maintain them or, build new ones. Whatever the decision is, that'll be a, a, a council and, and mayor kind of thing to decide, but it's also a people kind of thing to decide. Your opinion matters. Um, probably the, the hardest challenge that I faced coming in over the last year was the deaths that we had in the jail. That was devastating. You know, I mean, we, we take those kinds of things very seriously. We were no matter what the circumstances, when someone dies in your facility, it's it's troubling to you and you look at everything. And one of the things that I try to say when, when I talk to the media, God bless their hearts, you can give it to them in writing and they will still get it wrong, uh, was uh, that, that there's a lot of oversight in cases like that. And so when we finished the year and we actually had the GBI come and investigate them, we actually had the Department of Justice review each and everything. We did an internal review of everything. And the status was that the first young man had actually committed suicide and the others that, that passed away did so from natural causes. There was just nothing that anyone could have done for them. And I think that's an important thing for the people to understand. When people come to a jail facility, they come with whatever they got, y'all. 
if it's a drug addiction, if it's a, 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 an illness, that they come with that. And most of the time, I've, I've said this many times, when they walk through the back door of that jail, it's probably one of the worst moments of their lives. And they come in there however they are, and we begin to, to address their needs. But some of these people are very ill. Um, I was talk, uh, was talking to our medical a week or so ago, uh, uh, a gentleman that we had in jail who had a particular type of dialysis. And, uh, you know, we were trying to make arrangements to, to, to do something different because now that he's in our facility, the way he had done it in the past was just not going to work. All those things cost money. And this particular gentleman, there was no way to get him out of the jail because of the crimes he had committed. We dealt with, in this past year, uh, a gentleman who had, oh gosh, I can't even remember the number, 20 plus counts of enticing a child and sexual exploitation of children, and he was dying. And he was back and forth to the hospital on an everyday basis, but you couldn't put him out. Eventually, he did pass. We, we Finally, when he got to the end stages, hospice came in because they wouldn't even take him because of his charges. So one of the things that I would ask is when you see things like that in the media, give it a minute of grace before you jump to conclusions because a lot of times there's just, there's only so much we can do. These people come to us, they've, they've lived a life perhaps drug addiction, they've not gone to doctors. Many times, once they have come to us, we find things that they didn't even know that they had. We, we spend about $4.8 million between medical and mental health in this facility. So it is a huge, it is a huge part of being the sheriff, you know, the jail. Another thing, when we talk about where we've been and some of the things we've done, I think we've done well. I think we've, I think we've probably averted some some danger zones uh, in human resources, uh, in in inmates. So we've done that, but we've got to move forward, you know. And one of the biggest issues that we face with the sheriff's office, with the police department, I'm not sure about the marshal's office, he can address that, but is getting people who want to do this job. It is very difficult to recruit and then to retain people that will do this job, police officers, deputy sheriffs. I plan to go to council next Tuesday and address the pay because when I took office, I, I had 13 job openings. I now have 30. That doesn't sound like an awful lot, but, but, but it's a whole staff of the jail. It's a whole shift working the jail, guarding 1,138 inmates today. Today. That's another thing. When I took office, we had 900 inmates. Today, we have 1,138. Mm. That's, a, that's a huge strain on the old building. That's a huge strain on the staff. And it's a huge strain on the resources. Um, so I plan to go in and ask that that the sheriff's office be treated the same as the police department in pay. And I'm actually gonna mention the marshal's office as well when I do that, because um, one of the things that I'm gonna bring out is that, you know, the University of Georgia came in and did a pay study and they put us all at the same level. Well, not us, not me, but line level officers. Mm. And we have moved away from that. And I think we need to get back to it because the truth is that when the police department is extended, they're coming to us or they're coming to the marshal's office for our assistance. And so I think that our people deserve the same pay. Mm. So that's, to me, that is just the biggest thing in my mind, because I think if you take care of your people, your people will take care of you. Mm. And so in my mind, I want to try to take care of our people because that's important. Because I know, I've worked in all those positions, and I know what it's like to do those jobs and what it takes of you and the personal toll that sometimes it will take on you to deal with the needs of these of the people that we're dealing with. And so that's just paramount to me. And I'm also big on 
um, treating people fairly. Mm. You know, treating people fairly, treating your employees fairly. I think that's just huge. And I, I don't think, I think that's the foundation. And I've been around 30 years in Columbus, Georgia. And so, you know, I've seen everything. Mm. And, and I just think if we want to get and attract and keep people that will do this job, we've got to pay them a little wage and we've got to to begin to address those issues. And so for me, that's the biggest thing in my future. Um, we've done so many things to reduce jail population, but let me see a show of hands in this building. Y'all are really quiet. <laughs> who in here, who in here thinks that crime in Columbus, Georgia is a problem? Crime in Columbus, Georgia is a problem. Yes. So, like I said, when I took office, I had 900 inmates in the county jail. Today, I have 1,138. Mm -hmm. so, pe so people are going to jail, right, for crime? Well, <laughs> I would argue that you can put as many folks in jail as you want to. There's got to be somebody working in the jail to take care of them once you do that. So mm -hmm. that's where our part comes into that. I agree. I think crime is a problem in Columbus, Georgia. And I personally think there needs to be a comprehensive plan to begin to address that. And that's great. You know, I'm, I'm the sheriff. And, and so we have things that we do, programs that we sponsor, things that, that our people are a part of. But I, for one, believe that crime is a problem. We all need to come together and see what we can do to address that. We've done the programs to put people out. We've done that. We have a pretrial release program run by the sheriff's department. Currently has about a hundred people on it. I have two deputies that manage those. They've done this rapid resolution initiative that is supposed to clear out the jails, and they're supposed to get you through the court process. And hey, I'm all for it, but my count's eleven hundred and thirty-eight. Mm. So I, I believe we all can begin to have that discussion. So that's my vision for the future. I think that's going to have to happen in Columbus, Georgia. I, but I want you to know that. I'm thankful to be your sheriff, mm. and I thank you that, that so many of you, when I look out there, you know, supported me, made phone calls for me, walked with me, uh, came to events with me, and I want you to know how seriously I take the position that I stand in. I would never want to disappoint you, mm. and I truly value honor and integrity and communication and and I want you to know that. I'm not gonna be big in whatever's going on. You know, we were talking this morning about the government shutdown, um, and I get that. And I think that these are gonna be issues that the Democratic Party needs to address. Mm. But from my position, this my little piece of the world is, is effectively running, managing, leading the Muskogee County Sheriff's Office and doing that in a way that will make each of you proud that you voted for me mm -hmm. to stand here and, and do this job. And so I am more than open to questions. I said I don't have that much to talk about, but if there's something specific you want to know, I would love to answer your question. Okay, Harry, you're Hi. first. Hi. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so it just had a, a question about uh, cash bail reform. Um, I'm reading that in several con states around the country, including New Jersey, most recently Alaska, um, they've uh, passed bills or like put bills into law, which um, which reform cash bail for nonviolent offenders or first time offenders as well, where they can finally, um, instead of like getting held in jail based like 500 up to 500 or something dollars bond uh that they can instead go um get released on 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 an assessment of their risk or as well as their ability to like show up for trial is that something also i don't know if it's like your purview or the purview of the of the uh, chief of police here in columbus um but if that is a um something that's also being looked at uh in order to like get more people including people who are in jail for like nonviolent offen offenses um out on their own cognizance with say ankle bracelets or their own cognizance that. You do that. When, when I talked about our pretrial program mm -hmm. that I have two deputies assigned to, that mm -hmm. is exactly what they do. They go in uh, every day and look at who came to jail. And if they meet a certain criteria, we will go down and try to interview them mm -hmm. and see. And it costs them nothing except to be monitored. Uh, there are plans in the future to have a stakeholders meeting. But 
we feel that about 50 people is as much as one deputy sheriff can monitor. Mm. Uh, uh, unfortunately, mm. a lot of the people that are going to jail are not going to jail or for the kinds of things that you can let them out for. Which mm. I guess is a good thing because then they're not out committing more crimes. Right. But we have approximately 100 people out on exactly what you're talking about. Right. Another one of the things that I did was city ordinance violations. Example, and we just did this in the last couple months. Um, say you're caught for drinking in public or watering or something that's specifically a city ordinance. Um, on my authorization, that can be let out after 10 hours. And that was what we said. After 10 hours, if you're here and you've not posted your $7,500, $150 bond, we will let you out on your own recognizance with your guarantee that you're coming back to court. Mm. So we've done that. Mm. Um, so we're looking at those sorts of things. We also can look at low-level offenses and, and perhaps do that, but that's a, a huge part of what our pretrial program is already doing. Okay. But a good question. Thank you. you can. Okay. Yes, sir. Would you support the decriminalization of marijuana in Columbia? It's like Atlanta. <laughs> yes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Get right on to it. Um, yeah. Well, let me say this about that, and it's a good question. They didn't really decriminalize marijuana in Atlanta. Right. What they did was to say, oh, well, if you get caught with it, it's only a $75 bond or whatever, whatever, mm. fine. Mm. But the fact is, that is still a violation of the Georgia law. Georgia. And it is still going on your record mm. as such. Mm. And therefore, when you go to get a job, mm. you know, that former employee, that potential employer is going to see that you had this misdemeanor conviction. Mm. So I think it's a, a wash in the sense of they're selling you a bag of goods that's not real. Mm. Could we do that? Certainly we could do that. But the truth is, it it's not really, not really decriminalizing it. To decriminalize it, you would have to have, my understanding, the state of Georgia changed the laws right. on that. Mm. And... Um, Wow. You know, <laughs> right. I, I, let me say it this way. We took uh, four point something million dollars worth of drugs off the streets mm. a month or so ago, meth and heroin. And those things are killing people in Columbus, Georgia mm. and throughout the nation. There is a true opiate addiction crisis going on in the United States of America. Mm. If, it, it's kind of like what I said about uh, jail population. Let's see, do I need to hold on to the guy who was drinking in public or the guy who committed 27 armed robberies? Right. Hmm. I'm going to hold on to the guy that committed 27 armed robberies and the guy who was drinking in public after 10 hours can go home. Right. It's kind of the same philosophy in my mind about a misdemeanor pos possession of marijuana. Hmm. Do I care as much about him as I do about the guy who committed 27? Hmm. No. But I, but I do think if you're going to address it, you probably should address it from the state level. So it's hmm. technically a different level of crime. Right. Otherwise, you're not really helping anyone, especially young people who will buy into that mentality that it's true. Right. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, that's the best I can do. <laughs> right. I love thinking of people, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Mm. That's the Muscogee County Prison or Jack T. Rutledge, whichever one, but it's definitely not the Sheriff's Office. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's not me. Is it Marshall, do you know if it's Rutledge or? Muscogee County Prison. Muscogee mm -hmm. County Prison sends those in like that to collect the trash. Mm -hmm. They're not ours. Right. Yes, ma'am. Uh, okay. The best thing that I can come up with, other than being, first off, take care of you and your family. Mm. Be cognizant of where you are and who is surrounding you. 
you know, be, be smart about those sorts of things. Report criminal activity, of course. These are just commonplace things. But if you want to do more than that, I would suggest that perhaps you talk to your council representatives or your state legislators to say, what can we do? How can this community support our law enforcement? Is it pay that they need? Is it equipment that they need? What, you know, let them know that that is a concern for you about wanting to support us. And I think that would go a long way with them to say that this is priority. Because in my mind, it is priority. And of course, that's probably because I'm a sheriff. But I also believe that in a community, if people don't feel safe, then they're not going to want to build homes here and send their kids to school here and, and live here and work here. Or they may come and work here, but they're not going to live here and pay taxes. Mm -hmm. So that's just my perspective. I think that we've got to put a higher priority on these things. And I think that letting your legislatures, whether that's local, state, or federal, know that, hey, this community values that. Mm -hmm. And we want you to support. Mm -hmm. Wow. Good question. I love this. No clubs? No clubs. So they brought you from the Bradley Center to the jail when you were in an unstable mental condition. Well, I see that as a problem, but go ahead. But there was an incident, the reason I was there was because of the first time. And that was what was possible. So I went there to see if I could get some education. So when we did that, they sent me to jail. When we get to the jail, the guy that brought us in, and he said, okay, I want to know who you are. We all ate on the floor. There was a video of this. Of the guy that we from the bus is going to fall off the bus. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
he was in a mental health facility and moved from there to the jail facility. So, so bear that in mind too, when people talk about things, we are not a mental health facility. We are because we have mental health services, but we're certainly not the Bradley Center. We don't have what they have as far as being able to treat mental health. So, uh, Mm. I can't tell you what, why you ended up in jail. I'm going to have to say that I, they must have believed that you were a danger to their employees or you, there was some crime. Okay. Well, I can't argue with you, but that, that if they sent you from the hospital to the jail, clearly they couldn't deal with you. They believed they could deal with you. Okay. All right. Mm. I don't know all those answers, but hopefully when you're not there, hopefully you are seeking the services that you need. Good. All right, next, right here. Correctional officers and deputies. Sure. Uh, I believe it is currently, um, when I say 30, six positions were unfunded to fund rapid resolution, which means I can't hire six people because there's no money there to hire them. Okay, so when I say 30, that's six of those are, I couldn't hire them because there's no money to hire them. The other um, um, 24, I could be off one or two, but basically 13 uh, deputy sheriffs and uh, 11 correctional officers or vice versa, something to that effect. Of course, we try to have them spread out as much as possible, but but the largest majority of that is people who should be in the jail. There may be a few from operations, but the, most of that is from the jail. We are budgeted, supposedly, we were budgeted for 441 positions. Now, 80 of those positions are reserve deputies and bailiffs. So what does that take you down to? Somewhere around 340, mm. something like that. Of that, I would say maybe 30 of those are administration, you know, secretaries or whatever, official administrative assistants or whatever. The rest of those are officers of some sort. They're all either deputy sheriffs or correctional officers. That's what we're missing. And that's what we need. What do you mean the split? Oh, we, we should have 80 correctional officers. And, uh, you know, I'm having my first. Correct. They don't leave the jail. They have no authority outside the jail. They come in at a different pay grade. They're paid differently than deputy sheriffs. Whereas a deputy, is a deputy is a deputy. They may be assigned to the jail, but they have the ability to come out of the jail and do whatever. Eleven to thirteen, or something like that, is out of it, missing out of that eighty. Now the eighty, I'm, I'm, let me set that off apart to the side. No, those are we we pay reserves and bailiffs. Bailiffs work in our courts. You'll see them at our security checkpoints. They're civilians. So about forty of those are bailiffs, and about forty are reserves. Now our reserves can also work in the courts, security checkpoints. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So that leaves us what? Somebody tell me what 441 subtract 80 is. 360. There you go. Okay, so 361 is what would be left. All right. So of that 361, um, all I can possibly tell you right this second is that we're down 30. So a good 10 percent. Now some of those are going to be civilians. 20 to 30 of those jobs are civilian jobs. The rest are officer jobs. We don't have a whole lot of fluff as far as administration goes. You know. I just kind of get an idea of, kind of like what percentage of that is in the workforce. I mean, if any company in Columbus lost 10 percent of their workforce at 10 percent of their positions open, it would be hard to hire. Yes. <laughs> yes. You got it. Yes. It's good to understand the percentage of what that is and what that and and so what is that people that are actually holding those eleven hundred inmates or is that the people that are doing something else? No, 
Okay. Most of those positions are in the jail. Again, we do have an operations division which does the courts. It's the officers you see out on the street. It's the officers you see checking sex offenders. It's the officers you see serving warrants. So we do have some of those positions not filled. Uh, but a lot of those positions, but, and I can't move anybody else. It's kind of a catch sweet too. Can't move anybody else out of the jail to come fill these positions because I need to staff the jail. You have, you know, we're we're still under to some degree a consent decree with the Department of Justice to staff the jail, and we're struggling to keep the numbers where they should be, the officer to inmate ratio, because of this personnel shortage. I, I think when you talk You also have to consider when, when you talk about being able to do that, people are, are human and things come along. They get hurt, they get sick, their family members get hurt, their family members get sick, they're out on training, they're out on uh, military service, they're out on workers' comp cases. I mean, so you have to factor all of that in too because even if you have these numbers, there's going to be a certain number who they want a vacation day, they want a holiday. You know, you, you have to. Consider all of that too when you're trying to staff too. And so that's that's part of the issue as well. Always. Let me get him and then I'm coming right back to you. No, no, I, I believe the next one will say while first responder our base quality we've got we have salary salary based and then hourly based. Okay. I'm salary. <laughs> Everybody else in my department is technically not salary. They should be. Now, our majors and our captains are classified as exempt. They don't earn overtime. If if they were to earn it, we would just give them comp time. Everyone else is technically an hourly employee. How much first question? How much of a percentage of pay increase would you be asking? I, what I what I want to ask for is the same thing that they did for the Columbus Police Department. That way, we we're all sitting at the same. You know, we had that for many years, and we've moved away from that. It's generally depending on the person, the time, whatever, a two and a half percent pay raise. And it would. And the the important thing is this would affect the lowest level employees. I'm not asking for us. I'm asking for the guys walking in the door because or girls. Because we need them walking in the door. And then once we get them in the door, we need to keep them in the door. Because we're, we're having people, not just us. It, this is not just a Muscogee County Sheriff's Office problem. This is a Columbus Police Department problem. This is a nationwide problem of getting and keeping law enforcement. And I'm going to tell you this little story. This, If you take this, you'll, you'll get what I'm saying. My son is 26 years old. He has a high school diploma. He majored in partying in college. And... Um, <laughs> And he, and, he, and he went around doing what he did, you know, young guy, did several different jobs. But about four years ago now, he went to work for AT&T. Mm. Uh, and so they, uh, <laughs> hey. just saying, uh, he he went to work for AT&T and he worked selling cell phones, mm. starting pay $40,000 a year. Mm. You know how much we pay a police officer and deputy sheriff? Less than forty thousand dollars a year. Maybe the police forty, but starting pay for a deputy sheriff is a little bit less than that. So now, three or four years later, my son just got a promotion and he's working in Augusta and he's an assistant manager for an AT and T store. You know how much money he made last year? Fifty five thousand dollars. Nice. With a high school diploma, nobody shot at him. Mm. He didn't work Christmas. He didn't work holidays. He didn't work Easter. He didn't work shift work. Hmm. Wow. I'm like, yay. I'm just <laughs> glad you're supporting yourself. Mm. But the point is, <laughs> but the point is, it, we've got to put a little bit higher priority on teachers and peace officers. And, uh, you know, the, if we want a stable community, we're going to have to pay. You know, I said years ago. I believe Richard Hyatt, I told Richard Hyatt this probably 12 years ago, you're going to get what you pay for eventually. You're going to get what you pay for eventually. It's just a fact of life. That's kind of when they started doing away with all this, that, and the other. And 
Um, and we're just desperate to get people into work law enforcement. You're going to get what you pay for eventually. Mm -hmm. But that was just me, and I said that 10, 12 years ago. Yeah, you're very welcome. Uh, Sarah, Tom, thanks so much for yeah. coming today. We really, really appreciate it. I'm sorry I'm talking too much, Amy. I'm glad you're here. We're, we're, we're very thankful for it. Yeah, um, very you thankful mentioned to a few times about the resource training and mm -hmm. being able to staff, obviously, we've mm -hmm. been going on uh, with that conversation. Sure. When we're talking about criminal justice reform, um, we're talking about the resources that we are spending and diverting away from other things to staff our Yes. To increase the population in these jails. We're, we're coming into the election season. Um, we've had campaigns that are already tough on crime and stating that we need to do more. Yet we're seeing enforcement of the laws targeting low level, targeting marijuana crime and going on in rape, where we're incarcerating folks for, for things that are seemingly low level, but non violent. And we're increasing the population in our jail and we're, we're losing resources. How do we go about doing this where we can make sense of the enforcement and capability, where we're not throwing more people in? Because the studies that keep coming back to this is that we're incarcerating individuals and it's completing the cycle again, um, where these folks are leaving their families. Jail. Um, their kids are becoming offenders after this, and, and it's continuing this cycle of poverty, continuing the cycle of the criminal justice system. How do you propose the enforcement? If I could answer all of those questions, <laughs> I would be a hell of a president of the United States. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But I can't, but I get it, and I see it, and yes, and, and you're accurate. Um, <laughs> You know what? I kind of said that. It, yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it. I'm with you. I hear you. Who, who do we and how do we encourage our criminal justice officials just here in Muskogee County to, to focus enforcement on the things that actually matter? Because we're seeing people get shot left and right every day. A few minutes from my office, we had a gentleman that was uh, killed in a robbery at the pawn shop off of uh, Victory. There's, there's violent crime here that... We're, we're, we're focusing on a lot of different things. And, and, I, and you know what? The, the, the truth of the matter is, I think that the, I'm not the police chief, okay? And we, we have very different functions. We all have the same basic level of training. A deputy, a deputy marshal, a, a, a police officer can all answer this, a call for assistance. They can all, um, you know, write a traffic citation. They can all... Um, you know, write you, a, do an accident report, you know, basic skill set. How the chief chooses to uh, police Columbus, Georgia, is something you'd really have to ask the chief. So and the, so in that, for, for we the, don't the, do the that. Of our, our marshal, the sheriff, the police, it's a little convoluted for what you So is the chief of police an elected official? No. Uh, no, he's appointed by council of the mayor. So That's the council of the mayor needs to be addressing these issues. But I, in his defense, and, and this is all I will say, I think he hears the cry of the public. You know, as far as we got murders, I mean, I remember reading an article the other day about some gentleman who walked out to get into his car and 17 rounds were fired at him. But, you know, he doesn't tell me how he's policing the public because that's kind of his thing. And so, but, but, but we would work together when we need to, and we do. Um, and, and Marshall works with us as well. So um, I get what you're saying. How they go about doing that, that's kind of... But I, but once they get into my jail, one of the things that I can do is, is, is begin to look at what are you charged with and why are you in this facility. Judges should be looking at those things as well. And I think they do. I really think they do. But I, I will say this. The last time I did a comprehensive look at some of that stuff, because I think there's a misconception that people are sitting, languishing in the county jail for misdemeanor marijuana possession. It is not true. It's hmm. not, not in my facility, they're not. I, I do not, I'm not gonna pay 44 to 47 to 49 dollars a day to keep you in my jail for misdemeanor marijuana possession. You're getting out of jail on bond one way or another. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, because I don't have the resources for that. 
I need to keep the aggravator, the salt, the armed robbery, the child molester. I need to keep him in jail. Mm. And I don't need to be expending those resources. So, so it's kind of a, that's why I say we do need to comprehensively look at it. Well, and I, I get what you're saying, but, but what I'm telling you is that when I looked at who is sitting in my county jail, most of them are charged with very serious felony offenses. That's just the sad, unfortunate truth. We do not have tons of people sitting around on low-level crimes. So while I get what you're saying nationwide, they may have that nationwide. Unfortunately, that 1138 that is in my jail, and we have another system in Columbus, Georgia, that let me explain this to you too. If you are brought in on a misdemeanor, max case scenario, you're in front, you're in front of a judge in 48 to 72 hours anyway. But but worst case scenario, you're putting on a state court docket one week out, one week out. So um, they're going to dispose of that case if you're not out of jail on bond. Within a week or so. Yes, ma'am. Well, um, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, um, Sheriff, for coming. I've been listening to the gentleman down here, and I've been listening to the gentleman back here about about the problem that we're having in our community. Well, I'm going to speak on behalf of Mr. Uh, Pastor Richardson because I work with the Trinity House, which is a homeless shelter. For ladies that comes out of prison that has the mental problems so there so with that in 2017 2016 they're not doing what the gentleman is saying about the sale of being naked and, and all of this thing however they will send them out of jail and send them to a, a shelter when they have no place to go if we want to help our community with some of the crime then we're going to have to spend some of our time because the safe house is looking for people to mentor those young men that is coming out of jail with nothing to do. And we have stories, which some of us call them testimony stories that we can help. Grace house has men with mental because they can't stay at Bradley. They get let them out and then they have no place to go. And then they go to, Damascus Way is always packed. House of Mercy is over there. And they're always looking for some of us who have these amazing stories, how we came up from nowhere to help. And that's just taking time. And I'm not saying this because not boasting for me, Sheriff, but I take my Sunday evenings to go to a shelter for ladies for Bible study. I take my time to do devotional. Pastor Neil Richardson, who's over at the jail, he can put you to work at any time to help out those men at Safe House so people can want to go there to get established and get a job and try not to go back to their old ways. If we stand up, that's how we help our community, just like the Army. We help ourselves. And our community is doing, is having this problem with all this crime. But when you ask that 14 year old, that 15 year old, then he's telling you, he'll tell you what, what is going on behind the scene. But who has talked to that 15 year old? Mm. So what gentleman that has come out and seen has talked to him over at Safe House? The reason why they don't want to go to Safe House is because they don't feel like they're going to be helped. Mm. They are being 
you know, but we, we, need, need, well, we need but we need the community to yes, volunteer in yes, those places to and help mentor. You know, that's a very good point. It's not always a government solution. That, and and one of the things that I'm learning and beginning to learn, especially in this first year, is there are a lot of wonderful organizations in Columbus, Georgia, that are doing things. Damascus Way, Safe House, Grace House, say you know. There are a lot of different organizations that are trying to help this community, but what I see is it's a little fragmented. Perhaps a better idea would be taking some of, finding out all these wonderful resources and all these wonderful people in the community who want to help the problem and getting it more organized, maybe. And I'm sorry from, a, from my From a public yeah. perspective, not just looking to government or elected officials right. to solve these problems. That's an excellent point. Thank, thank you. Thank you. We, we have inmate workers that do that. Mm -hmm. And because you of certain. That's fair to be for, for and we also try to instill in, in people to clean your own area. Yeah. You know, that is part of being in jail is you need to take care of clean up your bunk, clean up your day room, yeah. clean up your area. But we also have inmate workers. It, an interesting thing is they can only use certain products to clean with, yeah. like you can't come in and use bleach because the inmates will do something horrible with it. I mean, it's just strange, the rules that you have to know about. So, but no, we don't call outside facilities or services to do that. Uh, we did have an incident. Do you think periodically maybe that would be advised? We couldn't do that. Come in and clean the jail. We couldn't do that because we could not secure outsiders in that facility. I mean, if uh, on one particular floor, we may have 200 inmates, and we can't guarantee your safety all the time while you're in there trying to clean. But we also, the, the workers that do this, um, some of them get, you know, extra credit, so to speak, time off their sentence or something like that, do, or pay. They get, it's a very, very minimal pay to do these well, things. Jacob comes into hospitals, mm -hmm. you know, and goes down. Does, does anybody go around to not jails or prisons that I'm aware of. Some kind of number on how they are, how they look, because I just doesn't make any sense to me to tear it down the middle of the Oh, no. No, I think that does happen. Oh, no. No. I think it does happen. No. What, what we are finding is, uh, again, back to the, the heating systems, the, yeah. you know, that sort of thing. That's what we're facing. Some of the, uh, uh, plumbing in, in these facilities, you know, these become issues that require people. But you know, you shouldn't tear it down because it's dirty. All right, last one right here. I got it. Um, I'm one of the citizens of the last chance to go to the center, and I was appalled at the right saw. Um, I was also appalled at the idea. Um, I 
Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, a lot of things were brought about in that study. One of those was the security of uh, the government center in the sense of how many inmates we bring to that facility on a daily basis and how we, it's not a very secure way. They're literally brought through the driveway and we have to secure them at either ends. We've been very blessed and fortunate not to have ever had an incident, but that's not the best practice of, of transporting inmates. Then they get into an elevator that may hold eight inmates. That also, it, it, it was built in 1970. That also is, is not good. Um, we've all heard horror stories about the elevators in the government center. Then when we get them to the floor, if those of you that weren't part of this, we've got two holding cells, one for males, one for females. Uh, and many times in this past year, we've had multiple defendants, multiple murder <coughs> defendants who needed to be kept separate. And in order to do that, at times we literally had to have a deputy stand with one of them somewhere else apart from the others because there is no room. They're like baby Jesus, no room for you in the end. Uh, <laughs> and so there's no room in the facility or the way it was designed in 1970. I don't think in 1970 they anticipated the court services being what it is today. My understanding of that building is there were floors that were empty. It, it just, you know, and I think sometimes a lot of people have a mentality of why can't we just, why can't it be like it's always been? Well, I don't know what the population of Columbus, Georgia was in 1970, but I believe in 2017 it was 202,000. And we have, we're not a little bitty city anymore. And, and I think that we've got to understand that. We're getting big city problems in Columbus, Georgia. We're getting gang activity in, in Columbus, Georgia. We're getting an overload of the courts in, in Columbus, Georgia. And I think we've got to understand that for ourselves, that we're not what we were in 1970. So yes, it does impact how we have to do business. It impacts our ability to uh, to secure, which is our mission. You know, we'll, the courts. Uh, you know, we have to move inmates many times. People are in court on a domestic, and they're looking right at the other person that because we just don't have anywhere else to put you. And that, so the, things have changed. Let's let's you know, life has changed, and and it has changed in the past fifty years. And we've got to begin to think, change ourselves, too. So. Okay, well, listen, I really appreciate this. <laughs> and if, if I can help you, and I and I would love to, to talk to you more if you have a specific question. But, uh, again, I want to come back and say thank you so much for your support. I I want you to know I'm working hard for you. And, uh, and it's been an eye-opening year for me to see some of the things that we are dealing with. Um, I think we have to, you know, I heard this said last week that we got to keep moving forward. We got to keep moving forward. And I don't think we can be stuck in 1970 with, you know, how we did things back then. Uh, I think I'm a product of that. We're moving forward. And so I'm certainly looking at where do we need to be in the future? What is it about criminal justice reform? What's our part that we can do? We, I think we're doing some of that with our pretrial releases, with our things like that. But I also think there is a true problem of crime in Columbus, Georgia, in the sense that many of our inmates who are in our facility are there for some very serious charges. And I think as of today, I have 56 people in jail for murder. Mm. 56. And 400 verified gang members. So when you start thinking about that, that is something to consider moving forward. I think uh, just like this gentleman talked about, we are the last resort. When nobody else can deal with somebody, they bring them to us. And and, uh, and we can't close the door and say, no, we're not taking them. So bear that in mind with us, too. Again, thank you so much. And thank you. Thank you, Sheriff uh, At this time, we're going to move on. We're moving along pretty good. Um, we're going to hear from Linda Parker. Who's going to talk with us a little bit about voter registration? And while she's coming, following that, I want the chairs of the subcommittees to be ready. Are any of the chairs here today? Two? <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, after that, we'll just have a little meeting, so we'll, we'll talk. Good morning, everybody. 
Good morning.
what that is. But uh, I'm, I'm on that for District 3. Uh, and one more thing, and I'm going let, to let you go. Um, we have two precinct changes. Two precinct changes. We only have 25 precincts as of today. And the precinct change came about uh, when some folks did a petition. So, you know, we got to be strong in what we believe in. If we're passionate about it, we need to work it. If we're passionate, not just sit. You know, a lot of us would, would just sit back and, and let somebody else do whatever. And we're not doing anything. And then we'll talk about it later on. Mm -hmm. Don't let me hear y'all talking about it. <laughs> okay. But anyway, that petition was done and the election board listened. And so now um, the Infantry Museum changed. Got people that want to go way out to the Infantry Museum. And so we changed it uh, to Our Lady of Lords. And Eddie also changed. So now Eddie and the National Museum will be going to Allen. We're going to try to push for people to ask Steve out. Yes. Yes, we are. Absentee. So you don't even have to go to the poll to vote. And then there'll be a paper trail. Yes, it'll be a paper trail. Exactly. And so we need to start working on that because our next election is May 22nd. Mm -hmm. Of course, we have early voting, and now we have, you know, Sunday voting, mm -hmm. and so we need we we got all kinds of opportunities to vote. Now, we can sit at home and vote. Who's got to use one for me? Mm. What was the question? What? Yep. I was asking who's the guy here is running for mayor. Oh, oh. Absolutely. I'm sorry, I wasn't asked. I'll be voting for you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Again, here in TV, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'll say this. Two names. Amy and Mitchell Smith. Mm. Oh, they have no idea, right? They got shot up in the garage. Mm. Do you think for one second those people are wondering if they're a Republican or Democrat? Mm. Not a bit. This is a community. The idea of my campaign coming up, and that's going to roll out little by little. It's just a pleasure to be able to stand up here and actually address the crowd for a second. I'll tell you this the one important thing that should have come through this day is that we need to figure out a way to get together and talk about these things. It's amazing that our leadership so far, um, coming into the future, for them to be able to sit down, all departments. I know you have very specific needs. I know you have very specific needs. I know Chief Warren has very specific needs. But if we don't sit down and talk about it, and if we don't sit down and unite and together find a way for me to all this comprehensive stuff that I have coming out, little by little, like, I'm so excited about right here. I'm saying so you guys do. But at the end of the day, it's about our community. Mm. And it's time to stop politics. And it's time to start community. Mm. And that is where I'm coming from, from the heart. I'll say it one more time. It's time to spot politics. And it's time to start community. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I realize where I am. I realize the audience I have. Mm -hmm. From the heart, I promise you. Especially with the crime. Mm -hmm. We got to figure out a way to get it. Thank you. Are there anyone else running for any election? I have to let you speak to <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm Charmaine Crabb. I am running for District 5 of the City Council, and I would appreciate your support. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here. I had the opportunity the other night. I'm Rusty Oliver. I'm running to represent you in the U.S. House. Here's the third district. I know Columbus is split into the second and third district, but I'm running for the third district, about the northern third of the county. I had the opportunity here to address the forum Tuesday night. It's online on the 
Facebook page. If you're interested in that, talking to me afterwards, I'm not sure how to get speaker today. I can hold you up anymore, but there's be no need. I'm active here on the Cody County Democratic Party, and I'm working to make things better here. Thank you, Al. I'll be glad to around and talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not running anything. My name is Patricia Laster, but I wanted to make some, an introduction to people that are resources for you. We're talking about young people. We have right here who um, Patrick Chappelle, who is the chair of the Columbus High School Democrat. Wow. One that is also the high school chair of the Georgia State Democratic Party. Wow. It's an elected position. And so he's doing that. And so he's a great resource for not just grown ups, but um, young people too, as to how to get this stuff done, when to get started, and all that. So look around. People don't have to look my age or anyone else's age. Go to the people that you know. So this is a resource. This one this is also in the Young Democrats, which is totally different from the high school Democrats. But we have people here that can help you out. And um, please, um, if there's any kind of way that you need a resource, either come to me or come to them, and we can find the people that will activate all of these registered voters that you're talking about. Okay. And thank you so much. And also, really, um, please introduce, um, talk about um, you are on the election board. Yes. They have meetings, and they're public meetings. They have public meetings, exactly. So that you can um, pretty much discuss um, where, um, what, what your voting rights are. You know, when, when to vote and all this kind of stuff. We, we fought for Sunday voting, and that's how we vote. Mm -hmm. We want to do things. So exactly. we want to make sure that we have voting that's accessible to everyone, not just because everyone can get registered to vote, but it's getting here into the house, getting that vote um, um, done. So I'm done. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Good. Good. Good job. Good job. Um, okay. I, 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 what, Yeah, but, um, we, uh, we're work on that. Sorry, I, I, I forgot to mention too that uh, that Chuck Gunderland is also running for di for district uh, th uh, three three as well. Um, so, so like we have like two Democrats running for uh, for that for that seat as well, and not uh, for Congress against Drew Ferguson. So yay. Um. Okay, well we are Democrats, and if one person uh, speaks, then everybody has to speak. Mm, true. <laughs> Yeah. I, I, I would like to uh, say, first of all, you all need to give yourself a minute for being out here this morning. I want to also let you know that the Muscogee County Democratic Committee and I have been instructed from high up down that we are the Muscogee County Democratic Committee. Committee. And not part of Georgia <laughs> and the National Red Party. We're the uh, committee of the party. But anyway, you'll see that from now on out, Muscogee M with MB60, that's mm -hmm. what you'll be seeing, and that's why we're doing it. But anyway, we're going to have our post committee meeting on the 29th here. The announcement will go out. We've been working on a calendar. Uh, the planning committee uh, has, us, has us moving a little more. Uh, we've got activities so far planned up through March, and you will hear about them. Hopefully, we will have the calendar and uh, to include all the meeting dates on the website so you can see that. But anyway, I want to thank the planning committee again. Now, all of those people who are chair, I just got two. Anyway, there are sign-up sheets in the back, and we were hoping all the chairs would be here, so if you were interested in that particular committee, you could talk to them about it. That's, that's the purpose of this session. So we have two chairs here, two sub two, uh, subcommittee chairs here, and you're welcome to talk to them. John is with plan, Dana is with the publicity, and okay. You all, if you're interested in those committees, please sign up. Uh, if you have not signed up for the Muscogee Democratic Committee, there's a membership form back there. Please sign up and you can make your choices of what you want to do. We need your help. There's a lot to be done this year. This is an election year. Mm -hmm. So we've got quite a bit to do. So again, I want to thank you all for coming. I think I've covered everything. Is there anything else? Just a, just a very brief in the nutshell, what, what, what our committees are and what, what we do. Um, as, oh, thank you, Carol. Right, John, John, do you need your glasses? Uh, no, thank you, Dr. Yep. Uh, uh,
I'm trying to dig, so I'm ready to Sarah Allison mentioned Iowa and the chair of the planning subcommittee. Um, we are responsible for devising the calendar for the year, also for coming up with programs like today. Um, and we also have the uh, committee a strategic plan, which is our roadmap of how we get to where we're trying to get, which is to engage Democrats in the Stogie County and to support our candidates in office this year. And so uh, the planning committee is responsible for revising that strategic plan and for monitoring the progress of all the subcommittees in uh, implementing that strategic plan. So that's that planning in a nutshell. Yeah, my name is Dana Zajac. I'm new to the party uh, or the committee, and I'm also the, sub, uh, the co chair with Carl up there for our uh, public relations and communications committee. Um, we're actually having a meeting next Thursday. Um, if you are interested in attending, we need any able bodies that want to get the word out. Um, as we've been stating here, our communications to our bank, to our party, and everybody in Muskogee County is urgent to me. Um, for us to be able to continue as a party and operate efficiently and get people engaged, um, that's our mission right now. So we are trying to get more folks engaged in our communication strategy, whether that's on our website, our Facebook, our digital platform where we're engaging younger voters. Um, I need people that are willing to work, put in the effort. And with all of our subcommittees that done, we're trying to get people signed up for, this is the work that we're doing as a part. Mm. It is the general membership that makes up these subcommittees that we really need to help to, to get the, the wheels rolling on this and get people engaged so that way we get our Democratic elected officials in offices representing our needs and our values here in the, the county. So uh, we have the sign-up sheets up here. Uh, John and myself are going to be available afterwards if you guys have any questions about what the subcommittees do, um, because we've got a couple of different ones where we really could use any able bodies, even if it's just showing up to the meeting and contributing your own uh, information to it. That, that's really what we're looking for. Thanks, man. If I didn't mention it, my name is John Lynn. I probably forgot to say that. It's a good if you don't know me. Uh, you have a question? I believe we're going to be doing it, uh, time is that Burger King on Megan? Yeah. Winston. Because we're really for a bigger event. Uh, yeah. It, it make, uh, yeah. Athlete, uh, you don't, you don't know? Uh, six to eight on the, yeah. If you sign up, you're going to send out an email. That's for like, that for a committee. So like, uh, yeah. just like, uh, like a publicity thing committee. So, um, but you're, it's open. Yeah, it's so like anyone. So you can put your email on the communications committee list back here. Um, I would get that out to that group. Okay. Just a quick rundown so we don't have to take a whole lot of time on this. And some of these are self explanatory. Bylaws and organization. We have bylaws to govern our oh, county so committee, the caucus, and they have to be revised like periodically. The that's what the subcommittee does. And also uh, make sure that uh, administratively we are following all the rules. They place down the program that they update their bylaws and their rules uh, periodically. We have to stay current on that. Mm -hmm. uh, membership. Uh, these are the folks on this subcommittee. Uh, I should mention the, the chair for bylaws, Dr. John Van Dorn, mm -hmm. the chair for membership, Al Alamor, and uh, the membership committee is tasked with encouraging people to join as general members like we're doing here today. Uh, also to monitor the involvement of uh, general members and try to uh, Educate uh, new members on the volunteer opportunities, not only uh, with the subcommittee, but also with campaign, uh, with you know, call uh, phone banking, canvassing, uh, and other types of field work, administrative work, or whatever the opportunities may be. Uh, they, they interface with you as a general membership and get you plugged into our program. Uh, candidate and inter party relations. We have certain responsibilities. Uh, to facilitate with the candidates' campaigns in the local county. Uh, we run a headquarters here uh, to help them, you know, on the ground here. And uh, this subcommittee helps uh, as a conduit between our entity and the candidate and uh, the state party as well. And the uh, chair uh, of candidate relations is Vinnie Miro. 
Mm -hmm. uh, outreach and education is also chaired by Val uh, Hollenworth. Uh, there's a lot of intersections between this and their membership. And this is essentially reaching out to the public, and drawing the public into uh, the party, uh, finding out who de the Democrats are in this county, uh, maybe uh, persuading some folks to become Democrats who didn't realize they were, mm -hmm. uh, and then getting those people involved in uh, a lot of our activities and uh, uh, programs. Uh, finance and budget. Um, <clears throat> Once we have resources, uh, we have to allocate those responsibly. And so, of course, the subcommittee uh, is tasked with uh, figuring out uh, how, what our resources are and uh, what we're able to do with those in a responsible way. Um, and the uh, chair of this subcommittee is our treasurer, Adrian Chester. And he'll be assisted by Tom McDaniel, who's here, here with us today. Fundraising. Um, that, that speaks for itself, I think. Uh, the resources that the finance and budget uh, subcommittee uh, allocates and monitors, we have to get it from somewhere. So fundraising, uh, normally we'll plan at least one major fundraising event a year, perhaps some small ones, and uh, try to get uh, donations toward our cause. You know, it costs money. Um, and I don't believe we have a chair of this committee right now, so if anyone out there, uh, you don't have to be uh, on the district post committee to serve on these subcommittees or even to be the chair. Um, it's uh, the discretion of uh, Chair Ellison uh, who will serve on these as, as the chair. So speak to her if you have an interest in that. Voter engagement. Uh, when Parker was just talking about the importance of getting people registered and uh, equally as important, getting them to Polls, making people understand why their vote is so important. We have a subcommittee to do that. Uh, we also have outreach to the high school. Um, folks can register as of their, when they're 17 and a half years old, and there are supposed to be programs in the high school to facilitate that. This subcommittee helps with programs like that. Uh, so they do a lot of canvassing and uh, they go to events try to get people registered and educated. Uh, and our chair is James Washington. That's what I mean. Okay, we have two <coughs> names for this one. What we've known as affirmative action, and we're moving to the uh, new branding is diversity inclusion. Linda Richburg is our chair for this one. And uh, this subcommittee uh, promotes diversity within our organization and in the community. We want to be inclusive of all stripes of people. We welcome everybody, and we want everybody to have an opportunity to participate, uh, including in the leadership. We want to balance uh, on our committee. And this subcommittee works with us to ensure that all our policies, our bylaws, and our practices conform with those principles that represent the, the core of our democratic party. So that's all the subcommittee. And, uh, I'll emphasize again, you, if you have not joined or renewed for this year as a general member, there's a form here. You can fill it out, and leave it with us. You can take it with you. There's an address to mail it to our PO box. If you prefer to do that, we're on the table back there. And we sure hope that you'll let us know uh, you're engaged with us and uh, that uh, there's a, a place on here to check if you want to participate not only in the committee, subcommittee here within our county, uh, there are also statewide caucuses on district groups, uh, such as uh, environment, working with seniors, disabilities, LGBTQ. Uh, you can uh, volunteer to work with those groups as well. Uh, uh, and again, the Sonic Teachers Subcommittee is up here on the table, and we're here to answer any questions. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> and uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we've come to the end of our program. If you all can want more information, we'll be standing around so you can ask us questions. But in the meantime, we thank you for coming and be on the lookout for our next meetings because you're welcome to attend. And we hope you have the rest of the weekend great. Yes, please. <laughs> Okay, go and get your baby.
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>